Hello, everyone, and welcome to the June 2022 Legacies and Lunch, a program of the Cal's Butler Center for Arkansas Studies. I'm Heather Register Zabinden, the Outreach Coordinator for the Bobby L. Roberts Library of Arkansas History and Art. The Roberts Library houses the galleries and bookstore at Library Square, the Butler Center for Arkansas Studies, and the Encyclopedia of Arkansas. The Roberts Library Research Room is open Tuesday through Friday from 10 until 5, and now you can join us every Saturday from noon until 4 to do your research. So we have a big announcement for next month. Legacies and Lunch will be going hybrid in July. So you can join us um, in room 124 at the Roberts Library to hear our virtual speaker talk about a new Arkansas Tech sports documentary. Um, and just like in the pre-times, you'll bring your lunch and we'll provide drinks and cookies. So you can choose to be either virtual or in person now. Today's talk is being live streamed to YouTube and will be available to view on the CALS YouTube channel immediately following the program. Today's speaker will answer questions at the end of the session. So please type your questions in the chat box on Zoom. So this month we have Pete Daniel, who will talk about his new book, Curating the American Past. Copies are available for purchase at the galleries and bookstore at Library Square. Pete is a former curator at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History in Washington, DC. He is an award-winning historian of the American South and the first full-time public historian to serve as the president of the Organization of American Historians. So everybody, please give Pete a warm virtual welcome. Thank you, Heather. And thank you for inviting me uh, to give this talk today about my work at the History Museum. And I want to stress, first of all, the excitement of working as a curator, because there was so much that was interesting in the uh, collecting, exhibits, research, and writing, and of course, the bureaucracy. And my career took place in the midst of a big transition from congressional funding to private funding. And private funders increasingly wanted to have celebratory themes. Some donors bullied curators. They violated museum standards. And they uh, were a lot of times threatening curatorial integrity. The current bans on non-celebratory history resonate with the issues we faced in the 1980s and 90s and, and part of this century. A theme runs through this book about how history museum leadership failed both to adhere to museum standards and to deny visitors the red meat of history. The museum should have done better. I was in my mid forties when I arrived at the museum in the fall of 1982. For years, I had taught at the University of Tennessee before moving to Washington with an NEH fellowship and then worked for two years for Senator Robert Morgan from North Carolina as a speech writer. And then he lost in 1980 and I was unemployed. But fortunately, I had a, a got a fellowship to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, which at that time was located in the Smithsonian Castle. And that's where I began working on breaking the land. And I met, I had met a lot of people at the History Museum and a curator went on leave. And so when my Wilson Center uh, fellowship was up, I was asked to replace a curator who had gone on leave. And then they kept me. I think I was fortunate that I had not studied museum studies or that I had any orientation material when I came into the job because I didn't know what I couldn't do. 
So I just started doing what I thought would be a, a, a good way to be a curator. And in 1983, I took a trip down, starting with Georgia, at the archives in Georgia, and looked at photographs, some of which I used in the book, and talked with the people there in the archives who told me about a cotton gin that they said was in, uh, I think it was Forsyth County. Anyway, I'll get to the right county in a minute. But anyway, they, they so on my way to Mississippi for the Chancellor Symposium, I tried to find that cotton gin, knocking on doors and risking barking dogs and so forth, but I couldn't find it. But what uh, they also asked me at the archives what I would do now that I was a curator. And I said, well, since most of my colleagues don't uh, think there's intelligent life south of the Potomac River, I'll try to collect things to show them the genius of Southerners. And so that's what was in my mind as I started out collecting. So eventually, with the help of the Georgia staff, well, first of all, let me say that um, I did eventually find the cotton gin, but on the way back from the, from the trip, I, I ran across this cotton harvesting right at the border of Tennessee and Mississippi and stopped to take this photograph, which I, I used in the book. So the, the staff at Georgia eventually did find a cotton gin in Monroe County and convinced the, and I convinced the museum's collections, collections committee of its value because I stopped there on the way to another history conference and took both my amateur photographs to convince the collections committee this was a really good object. And so Larry Jones, a brilliant museum specialist, Kim Nielsen, a photographer, and I piled into a rental truck and went down and collected this gym. And uh, here, I'll give you an orientation, in the center is the drive wheel. And it, the cover picture is of me driving out the wooden pegs that held that, that contraption together. And it has a metal ring around here that was connected to this pinion wheel, which drove, which penetrated through the floor and drove this cotton gin over here. So uh, that's the that's what we found. And Kim took these really good photographs. And of course, we were uh, it was August, I think we were working really hard. And so on the second day, we almost completed taking the whole thing apart. And we were sweaty and exhausted after loading the truck. And a delegation from the Monroe Historical Society appeared. And we took the opportunity because we were sweaty and tired and almost finished to pop a beer. And of course offered them one. And of course they, <laughs> They shuddered almost, and you could read their minds. You know, Smithsonian employees sweating like vulgar workmen, drinking like rednecks, and stealing one of their priceless treasures, although they never showed any interest in it. Since high school, I had drag raced on back roads and attended stock car racing. I'd been I had attended a lot of autom automobile races. This one was taken in 1973 at Road Atlanta. As you can see that my, my wardrobe and uh, hair presentation was a little bit different in those days. I went to my first Formula One race in Germany in 1970 and since then have been to a lot of Formula One races. And since the rural life held no charm for Smithsonian higher ups. I thought that perhaps an exhibit on ground effect and racing, including Formula One and American racing, would be instructive to the visitors of the museum. 
because the ground effect was, was something that was ex extremely interesting to me because it had been theorized by Lotus Racing's Colin Chapman. And Chapman was a brilliant manager of Lotus Racing. I'm sure some of you've read about him. And he theorized how to use ground effect to make cars go faster. Um, so let's see if we can get Chapman up here on the screen. I went to the UK and interviewed Tony Rudd about the development of the Lotus 79 that won the world championship with Mario Andretti driving. Here's Chapman at a race at Watkins Glen where I had uh, gotten into the pits. And uh, then I took a picture of Andretti in the Lotus 79 at Watkins Glen. So maybe that photo will come up. There's Colin and there's Andretti in the Lotus 79. Lotus promised to loan us the 79 and Jim Hall would loan us the, the uh, Chaparral 2J sucker car, which used a different principle to keep the car adhered to the ground, a, su a, a, a suction system, but it was ruled ineligible because it used a different power source. So I had all this, uh, a design of an exhibit that, that dealt with aerodynamics turned upside down, that, that would include beautiful race cars and a whole lot of other things that people might be interested in. But the head of design killed it, so it never happened. But I understand from my friends at Air and Space Museum that when it reopens after renovation, there will be an exhibit on ground effect because it's such an aerodynamic principle. Although I was a nine to five bureaucrat, on nights and weekends, I continued research and completed breaking the land and standing at the crossroads in the mid 1980s. The Smithsonian awarded fellowships and I became a mentor and in 1984 began a journey with museum fellows after the Tuesday colloquiums to a local bar, where in addition to analyzing the colloquium, discussing their sources and projects, we degenerated into the usual unsavory bar discourse. Most of these fellows were intent on their dissertations and their enthusiasm and mastery of current methodology and scholarship providing me with a continuing education. Many discussed their writing. They passed drafts of chapters before me, drafts of their dissertations. Some asked me to serve on their dissertation committees. So I was very much into the fellows program and did not, as in academia, hold myself divinely aloof from graduate students, but rather associating with them and involved and was involved with them in their social lives and their intellectual projects. Over time, museum fellows I mentored and those who joined us at the bar have filled four shelves of books that I have here. Here's a group of them, uh, some fellows, some friends uh, that gathered in my backyard. Uh, so we, I had a number of parties. Interns also furnished a wonderful addition to the staff and I introduced them to the Library of Congress and the National Archives, unlike some curators who just told them to Xerox stuff. Annette Day arrived from the UK in 1984 and left a journal of her six months at the museum. Her work on exhibits, transcribing interviews, searching offsite collections, and installing exhibits. Here's Annette on the right. In the center is Smita Dutta, who was in, in Babel working on the science exhibit, and of course me. We were at a, an exhibit opening when this photograph was taken. I focused on my job, but increasingly events at the museum gave me pause. David F. Noble was hired soon after me, 
and he had recently written America by Design, winning a deserved reputation as a leading historian of technology. David was contentious, to me one of his endearing qualities, but his incessant questioning of Director Roger Kennedy uh, and his agenda and the director's opposition to the exhibit he planned, Automation Madness, led to a major falling out and he was fired. When congressional funded ended in the 1980s, David presciently analyzed the danger of private donors. Fundraising obviously focused on wealthy donors, David observed, <clears throat> who of course would push their own agenda. So he appealed to Director Kennedy to set aside discretionary funds for exhibits that, that did not appeal to donors. Donor pressure, he sagely observed, was rarely heavy handed and quoting David, instead curators subtly and oftentimes unconsciously tailor their proposals in such a way as to attract and sustain funding. Whether this was actually requested by pr pr prospective donors or not. Over time, there were numer numerous examples of directors and curators yielding to donor desires. In most cases, donors sought to present sanitized US history, a trend that has now become weaponized. In the mid 1980s, our division sponsored Lou Ann Jones and her oral history of Southern agriculture and her interviews with some hundred men and women Blacks and whites and Hispanics. Smithsonian photographers sometimes accompanied her and documented her work. The interviews and images preserve a major source on Southern rural life in the first quarter of the 20th century. And here's Lou Ann with Charlie Bailey in Mississippi as she was interviewing him, one of the people, one of the many people she interviewed. And Laurie Minor Penland took the photograph one of several photographers who would uh, go with Lou Ann to do this interview. Two exhibits dom dominated my 1990s decade, Science in American Life and Rock and Soul Social Crossroads. I was one of four curators assigned to the science exhibit and we fought to present an exhibit informed uh, by history rather than what the sponsor of the American Chemical Society wanted was a celebratory story of scientists. They did not like us including what happened outside the laboratory and that led to major uh, fights and a lot of tension. We tolerated criticism from the, the ACS leaders and even the Smithsonian secretary maligned our work. Historian of physics Paul Foreman and I went to Hanford, toured one of the first reactors that produced plutonium and ultimately, ultimately collected this control panel and moving footage of Hanford's construction. First Louis Hutchins and then Smita Dutta worked closely with me throughout. The exhibit opened in the spring of 1984. Museum and Smithsonian leadership came to punish scholarship and purged, for example, the Trail of Tears from a 19th century exhibit, complaining that there was, quote, too much white male bashing. Retiring curators and specialists were no longer replaced. And the 40 curators in the museum when I arrived declined to the late 20s by the turn of the century. Rock and Soul began before the science exhibit opened. And in 1992, our crew traveled to Memphis to interview people connected to the music business, including Sam Phillips, who at Memphis Recording Service recorded B.B. King, Howling Wolf, Elvis Presley, Carl Perkins, and of course, many others. We also interviewed Jim Stewart, who with his sister Estelle Axton created Stack Studios famous for Otis Redding, Sam and Dave, and many others. Our interview team, headed by producer Lee Woodland, 
with Gary Gaboy on camera and Rick Patterson on sound aimed for perfection as shown by their attention to Betty Berger. Betty had many stories to tell. She was in the midst of 1950s and 60s Memphis music and musicians. For me, sitting across from musicians who were the soundtrack of my high school and college days provided a humbling but exciting opportunity to learn about 50s music behind the scenes and also to take photographs when we paused to let Gary change the tape in his camera. So I would take pictures of people, Carl Perkins, for example, who had sweated through his shirt as he was, uh, we were in the, new, the old daisy, which for some reason the air conditioner wasn't working, but Carl Perkins toughed it out. And then there was Fred Ford, who I joked, if there's a God, he would look like Fred Ford, uh, who was a, a, mu a musician who told us a great deal about Memphis music and his role in it. He, he was still playing when we interviewed him. We also collected objects to stress the impact on rural life that music had, because in rural life, of course, there was country music, blues, and people would listen to the radio and knew all the popular songs. So we also collected instruments and signage and just were, were very interested. But there are a few more pictures I took of uh, some of the people we interviewed, like Rufus Thomas, who recorded both at Sun and Stack Studios. Jim Dickinson, who actually played on one of the Rolling Stones albums and who was an incredible voice of Memphis music. He understood so much about it. Well, this exhibit that had its issues opened in the spring of 2000. And this was the introduction, which is, which as you can see, uh, has a theme of rural life way up all this. And some of the critics didn't think rural life was important at all, despite blues and country music and gospel music, all of it had a rural background, but we insisted. So this was the exhibit uh, opening. And then uh, these were the players who worked with me, Hank Grosso, who was the designer sitting on the left, me in the middle, and Cammie Clough, who managed the whole thing and protected us from much of the maliciousness of the History Museum, jealousy from others, and just did a superb job. Then there was the opening. We finally got the exhibit up and we had the opening. And of course, this is me with Billy Lee Riley, one of my favorite people, just an incredible musician. I could tell you stories for a long time about his career and how he kept producing music. We interviewed him twice. I also invited University of North Carolina Press's Paula Wald to the opening because she had edited Lost Revolutions and did an incredible job as an editor. She also uh, edited Dispossession, just a superb uh, editor. Lost Revolutions ran on a parallel track with the exhibit and profited from our interest and research. There was a signing in Memphis the week before the exhibit opened and Rester Speckman Monroe, who we had interviewed months earlier, attended. He was a big hit because he's a presence. So he, as I sat down behind the table with the signed books, Sputnik pulled up a chair and sat down beside me. And as the first person came and asked me to sign the book, she looked over at Sputnik and said, will you sign the photograph of you? And he smiled and said, page 127, sweetie. And he just uh, was a hit. And here's me and Sputnik and Jim Lanier and Brenda Lanier uh, after the the signing while we were just all having a good time. And another part of my career, the photography curator's lethargy allowed me to put up exhibits such as official images, New Deal photography. Here on the right, you see the entrance to official images. 
And on the left is a book that I did with, as you can see, Murray Foresta, Marin Stange, and Sally Stein, who were all historians of photography while I was just a historian. They were brilliant women, and we this book is still exciting to people because of their ability to make sense out of the photographs in these New Deal agencies. Debbie Caffrey, who photographed mostly in, in the early days in Louisiana, especially during grinding season in the Cane area, which first attracted me, intrigued me and I collected some of her work for the museum, successfully convincing the collections committee of its value as documentary, although it's mostly uh, very creative. And then I collaborated with, with Debbie on this book uh, of her photographs. And on the cover is a, one of her images called Papa. And when the press wanted to use some conventional picture of hands on a bucket or something, we convinced the press that some other people might take that picture of hands on the bucket, but only Debbie Caffrey could take this photograph. Of course, her work now is internationally known and she has exhibited all over the world. As I gained a wider reputation, I was invited to give lectures both here and abroad. So, uh, I went to a week-long conference in Berlin, and then the Chernobyl cloud followed me to, to Munich and then to Monaco for the Formula One race. And here you see Arrington Senna, the best race driver I've ever watched, at the uh, chicane coming out of the tunnel. In 1993, I traveled to Nanjing and Beijing, China, and my hosts were charming and the food excellent. Wayne Semin in the red sweater were translated for me and later spent uh, four months as my house guest. It was becoming more and more difficult to maintain the exhibit standards. As first Lawrence Small became secretary of the Smithsonian, uh, claiming he was a Renaissance man that had collected masks and things in South America. And then uh, he demanded an exhibit on the presidency to be done in a few months, which of course you don't do in a museum. Uh, and he received harsh criticism for the presidency exhibit, which was fairly mundane. It turned out that Small did not collect the masks and objects that he said, but he bought them. But despite his egregious violations of standards, uh, he lasted seven years before the regents awoke and fired him. Brent Glass arrived as director at the History Museum in 2001 and soon partnered with Kenneth Baring to uh, help do the presidency. And then an exhibit on war called The Price of Freedom, which was another embarrassment. Then Catherine Reynolds offered $40 million to do an exhibit on great achievers, which had all the subtlety of a wax museum. And the donors attempted to force this on the museum. But anyway, they met with a solid wall of resistance from curators and scholars. And so Reynolds withdrew her millions and pouted. Along with the falling number of curators and museum specialists who did crucial work, the number of specialists also diminished. Here, Bill Worthington and Stan Nelson and Larry Jones, who were specialists, are visiting Larry's uh, workshop at his home up in uh, West Virginia. They were incredible people who made the museum work. Time forbids my dealing with the numerous collections and restorations projects, such as Jeff, Jeff Tinsley's poster photograph of the John Deere D and the heart part, the restored heart part uh, that Larry Jones and I shepherded, but Sherry Schaefer took this photograph and it was her dad, Oliver, and her and several other people who restored this tractor. Uh, and it was exhibited uh, soon after that. 
Sherry did the canopy you can see using drawings and trade literature. The museum closed for renovations for a year and a half and time does not permit me to explain the, the issues I had with the director, Brent Glass. He appointed me along with a dozen others to work on an introductory exhibit. And we had almost completed our work after a year and had a narrative and ready to go into production when he abruptly pulled, pulled away from it, trashed us. Uh, we heard that Kenneth Baring did not like our concept. And then Glass came up with another committee and another committee. I, don't, I lost track of how many committees he had to try to do an introductory exhibit, none of which happened. I finally got so exasperated with him that I attacked him in my presidential newsletter when I was head of the OAH and criticized his thraldom to bearing. He never succeeded in putting up an, an introductory exhibit. Then in the spring of 2008, Grace Palladino, a good friend, confided to me that a group of former fellows conspired to hold a conference in my honor in Memphis. And that Jim Lanier at Rhodes College would put up the people in the dorms and that there would be classroom space available for all the presenters. They put me up in Lauderdale Courts in the very apartment where a young Elvis Presley had once lived. The program was titled Region, Class and Culture, New Perspectives on the American South. David Less, who had helped enormously on the Rock and Soul exhibit, planned a peat fest on the Friday night of the conference at the New Daisy on Bill Street. And here you see the marquee, which is my moment of fame. Billy Riley, Sonny Burgess, both from Arkansas, and a host of soul musicians, most of whom we had interviewed, performed and the dance floor filled. Sally Stein took this photograph of Billy Lee Riley, staring, uh, pointing upward at a blue and a, a red light with Sonny Burgess on the right hitting a few links and one of Jim Dickinson's sons on guitar. Six months after this, I was in the African bush and decided that since I was turning 70 in a few months, that it was time to retire and amuse myself with completing dispossession, trips to the bush to photograph wildlife and writing this memoir. Thank you, I'll be glad to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Pete. That was fabulous. I apologize for my technical difficulties there in the middle. I hit the wrong button and it all went crazy. You would, it think, worked out. <laughs> you would think two years into all of this, it would go as smooth, smoothly as I want it to, as I envision it to. Okay. Um, we have some great questions. Okay. So Mark Chris would like to know, and I want to know this too. You said at the very, very beginning, meat of red meat of American history. And he loves that phrase. So can you define that red meat of American history? I think the easiest thing to say is simply that it's the part of history that deals with the real people instead of leaders and politics and things that are usually taught too much. You know, there, there, there's so many things that are what I would call the savory parts of American history, which are so compelling. And uh, most of what I've written deals with working class people. And I think that's pretty much what I mean by red meat, because these are the people who built this country and they're not all white. And they're not all male. That's the, the beauty of this country is that people come from everywhere, with every shade, every religion, all that. So that's what I think the red meat of history is. It's not all the celebratory things. There's plenty of celebratory things to talk about, but there's also things that are informative. Yeah, I love 
I love that phrase. Um, that bread and bread meat of American history. I'm gonna I'm gonna use that. I will definitely quote you. I will give you credit, but I'm gonna okay. use that on a regular basis. Um, Katie would like to know: Can you elaborate on the reasons funding for the museum shifted from government to private funders? All I know is that in the mid '80s, the government, and it could have been under Reagan no longer wanted to support cultural institutions like the Smithsonian Institution and its exhibits. And it's not that Congress didn't exert pressure on museums to do respectable, good exhibits, but they didn't have that agenda of always having a celebratory narrative. And when that shift happened, the, the Smithsonian rolled with it. And as David Noble pointed out so presciently, that changed the way museum exhibits were constructed intellectually. And so it was a major shift that in Science and American Life, I fought with the donors. It was, it was savage. And in uh, some of these other exhibits that I couldn't have a big voice in, I saw them cave. And I'm sorry, but I don't like to cave. And I will fight for what I think is true history. And I don't, I don't mind who I'm fighting with. On science, we actually had to meet with some Nobel laureates and others from the American Physical Society as the head of the Smithsonian was trying to humiliate us and have us raked over the coals by these really intelligent and well-meaning scholars. So we met with them and we each gave a talk about what we thought the, the exhibit had amounted to, it was already up. And then we had lunch with them. And I was sitting beside Burton Richter who, we had a pleasant conversation. I mean, it was the thing where they realized we were not making stuff up and that this is what we envisioned and they liked most of it. It was only when we walked outside on the terrace and the rector started asking me, you know, what's that dome over there? It's the Library of Congress and so forth, that I learned that, that he was a Nobel laureate. <laughs> so a lot of things happened, but I always defended our work. Uh, and I can give you some other stories of people who, during the, uh, the Rock and Soul exhibit, criticized my my script on rural life, claiming that there were no people who washed clothes in wash pots over an open fire after 1900. And I said, well, people wash clothes over wash pots over a fire in my yard when I was growing up, which I think he doubted, but just he didn't have a clue. Anyway, so you had to fight these things, but I, I never, and I, let me just add that I, I was working, Lonnie Bunch was our head of uh, curatorial affairs at the time. Lonnie always backed me. And uh, <laughs> so I'll give him a plug. He was always ready to defend history the same way he is now. So good for Lonnie. Yes. <laughs> um, and, you know, in grad, so I was in graduate school um, in public history in the early 2000s, and we studied the bearing gift and the controversy around the Bering gift and the Reynolds gift. Um, and that was part of our graduate school oh. training. That's one of yeah. the, we read articles about it. And yeah. Um, so yeah, it, I remember it was a big deal. And um, that president's exhibit that you talked about, I mean, to, to do president's exhibit, a uh, president's exhibit in that amount of time. Um, that's insane. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And plus, you know, another exhibit on great white men, bless their hearts. But I think that we've had uh, a lot. There's plenty that can be found out about great white men, but there's so much working class history. And of course, things changed. I was fortunate when I came along, the, the study of African-American history was uh, moving into another stage as black scholars were more recognized and their work was more recognized and things started 
happening. And of course, it just continued to change. I mean, with women's history, minority history, all those things. So our history is much richer now than when I went to college. Well, and I think that for a lot of times, it's you want to be able to see yourself mm -hmm. in an exhibit, right? And and we're not all white, we're not all male, and we're not all famous. So to right. see, you know, to see the everyday person in an exhibit is really important to the to the visitor. Yeah. Um, so Joe Hudak, who's the head of the main library here, would like to know. Was there anyone you wanted to interview for Rock and Soul, but weren't able to get together with them for whatever reason? Yeah, Johnny Cash for starters. And you know, we tried uh, and we wanted to interview Estelle Axton, who was the co-founder of Stack Studio, but she was not well. And there were other people. I, I thought we'd never get to interview Jerry Lee Lewis because he was, of course, ornery and <laughs> his, his endearing qualities. But we finally did it and it was really fun to sit across from Jerry Lee Lewis and interview him. Yeah, uh, It was just a moment. And uh, he had had some root canals a couple of days before. He was not feeling well. He'd cut himself shaving. He was bleeding when he came out to interview. He was sweating profusely. And so uh, we got him dried out and got the blood staunched and cleaned up. And he was, and his daughter was saying, Daddy, you really want to go through with this? And I was saying, please, please don't say that. And then, you know, he looked at me just really antagonistic and said, when's this damn thing going to start? I turned around to Gary at the camera and I said, Gary, he said, we're rolling. I turned back to Jerry Lee Lewis, click, professional, total professional. It was just wonderful. <laughs> That's great. So there um, were probably some others, but they were the main ones. Um, so Cody Berry works in a small museum and he says, how might you do better to promote ourselves, her, his small museum um, in the digital age? Have you ever helped somebody find a home for a historical artifact? So I guess digital, how do you promote yourself in the digital age? And then the artifact is a second question. Well, I'm sorry that I am the worst person to ask about digital promotion. For example, this book that I'm talking about today, I'm terrible at promotion. I went to a, a book fest and sitting beside a Civil War guy that had a pile of books, fiction books, and I had my little book there, and hardly anybody stopped to ask me anything. And I didn't have a big display up saying, learn all about the Smithsonian behind the door. Da, da, da. I just can't do it. So I'm no good at answering that question. But I have placed objects that the Smithsonian uh, the, got rid of. Uh, and it was mostly difficult to get rid of some of the, the things we had that were that were on the books. And so I'm not probably any good at that either, answering that. I'm sorry. Well, I think I think a lot of times, you know, well, we do want to keep what we have, right? You don't want to yeah. you don't want to have to deaccession um, if you don't have to, I do think there, I do think that a lot of museum people are better now at saying this isn't a right fit for me or yeah. for this institution, but you should contact these people, um, you yeah. know, kind of be more specific to our mission as opposed to just America's attic kind of deal. Yeah. Yeah. I've directed people to a different, to a different place that would be more receptive. So Kat says, you describe a real sense of community, whether among curatorial teams or interviewers, interviewees, or scholar, scholars and fellows and museum staff. Can you speak more to how funding shift, how the funding shift affected this? So how the funding, shifting the funding affected the sense of community amongst colleagues? Well, it, it, there's a lot of context here because when this happened, 
in the 80s, from the, probably the late 80s on to when I left, the number of curators declined, the morale declined, the specialists declined. There were so many things going on that were detrimental. And then you had directors coming in who were, I can't even find a polite word to describe them with. But anyway, they were detrimental to what we were up to. And so that culture changed in part because people left, in part because leadership failed. And so it was just a gradual thing of, of a, a collision of things that destroyed mor morale. And there were studies done I, that are in the book of, of morale in the Smithsonian at large. And it was just terrible. Any board of regents would have just kicked ass and thrown people out. But the regents just uh, didn't pay any attention to it. So it, did, it declined for these reasons, but the people who should have been trying to hire curators and do good exhibits and so forth, they weren't doing their jobs. Well, and it's so important, I think, that when you're, you know, a lot of the folks at the top, director type positions, secretary type positions, they get appointed, right? Those are appointed positions that's probably never going to change. But having those people at that, that higher up position supporting you because you've been trained and you know what you're doing is worth its weight in gold. Yeah. And it, when it doesn't happen, it's disastrous. Um, and it can be at a national level. It can be a local level. Um, but it is, it's it. And it, it it's terrible on morale, um, but we we train to do this, right? I mean, we we know what we're doing, and we're not. I mean, I always like to tell people, I am not completely crazy, and I do not have an agenda. So, like, let me just do my job. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me just add that, yes. uh, with all due respect to wealthy people, they don't know history as well as I do or as well as you do, Heather, or all you people tuning in, you know, they don't know your job, but they're quite willing to try to tell you what to do. And yeah. they think that money substitutes for intelligence, but I've got news for them. Okay, Heather. Okay. <laughs> um, so Carla Coleman has a comment. She just says, great truth in history lesson. Thank you, thank you. Um, when we know better, we do better, which is so <laughs> true. Carla is very wise. Um, so Kat would also like to know who stands among your all time favorite interviews conducted in relationships to your exhibits and why? Is that like picking a kid, like your favorite child or something? <laughs> well, if you look at the people I interviewed, that's a tough question because so many of them were just wonderful. And probably the one, the one I liked best was Billy Lee Riley. But the one who was most uh, interesting was Sam Phillips, who, of course, was at Sun Studio. And when we arrived at Sam's house after playing tag with him for months, he called us into his little study and told us, you don't interrupt me. And you know, I'll, I'll run this thing. I mean, he was just adamant. And of course, he was Sam Phillips. What are you going to say? So we started the interview, and he went on for the whole tape change, 30 minutes, talking about uh, his life, the way he wanted it presented. And we changed tapes, and that's when I took the photograph of him, which I love that photograph because he's got that sort of look that's a little bit crazy. And that was the real Sam Phillips. Okay. And he... Then we started interviewing him and he was really a good, he was, he's so articulate. He's lived such an incredibly interesting life. The stuff that man has done, the people he's known, all of that. And actually I became fairly good friends with Sam Phillips overall because he was involved with the exhibit. And so I had to deal with him a number of times so that was one of the most interesting people I've ever interviewed. So that's my answer. <laughs>
So are there any exhibits, Joe would like to know, are there any exhibits you put together in hindsight that you regret? Did I? That you regret? Anything you put together exhibit wise that you regret? No. <laughs> I mean, there are things that I could have made better in, in hindsight and, and, and so forth. But as far as the exhibit, for example, Science in American Life, we had to go through all kinds of things to, to keep the integrity of that exhibit. And it was, a, it was a long, hard fight with people like the education people in the museum who didn't have a clue and who I had to basically just say, you don't know what you're talking about. To the American Chemical Society, they had a panel. We had to, a panel of historians of science we had to try to please. And one guy objected to our fallout shelter. And you know, time after time, he said, you still have that fallout shelter. And finally he said, there weren't many fallout shelters. This was just one of these fads. And, and one of the other people on the panel, all who were distinguished historians said, there were lots of them. And this guy put his head on the table, you know, just crushed. Yeah. So the, the fallout shelter stayed. So we had to fight things like that. I always found that there were there were times where I wish I could have done something, but we like ran out of money. I mean, there were many times yeah. where money or the technology wasn't quite there yet, yeah. or maybe maybe more the technology was there, but the expense of the technology <laughs> was not meeting with my budget um, for yeah. us to create yeah. something that I wanted. Yeah. Um, so Kelly Jones, who's a professor at Arkansas Tech University, would like to know if you have any dirt on Jeannie Wayne as a young, bright-eyed fellow. I do. <laughs> <laughs> so Kelly and Jeannie, um, Dr. Wayne, are working on, um, they, they edit a book series together. So I'm sure she would like to talk to you at some point at length about dirt on Dr. Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, she, Jeannie has always been one of my favorite people. She came to the museum working on her dissertation. And were, as you know, Jeannie works hard all the time. And so she did that. She was just so industrious. And she would call me and say, Pete, I want, she's down in her carol. I want to talk to you about this question I have. So Jeannie would come up and sit down and she would start talking about her problem. And I would sit there and nod. And a half hour, 45 minutes later, Jeannie would say, thank you for solving that problem, Pete. And I'd barely opened my mouth, but she <laughs> needed to talk through it, which she was willing to do. And, and so Jeannie and I have been friends ever since. So tell her hello. <laughs> Kelly, tell her hello from Pete. Um, well, thank you so much for doing this. That's all that, if anybody has a last minute question, um, type it in the chat. This has been um, this has been great. Also, Tom DeBlack is on the call as well <laughs> as Randy Finley. Oh, hello to both of you. Randy, <laughs> why haven't you told me any good books to read lately? I'm reading some very interesting things now. I should email you about them. So uh, Randy and I have over the years given each other hints on good books to read. And Randy is a voracious reader and has over the years instructed me a lot. That is, that is a good relationship to have. Somebody who can recommend good books to you all the time um, is, a, is an important person to have around for sure. Oh, yeah, I'm always looking for things to read. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, Randy was very good at recommending things. Well, thank you again so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. I, for everybody, I emailed Pete um, a couple of months ago and I said, I saw you talk in Helena, Arkansas at the Delta Cultural Center probably 20 years ago. And <laughs> you were one of the best speakers I've ever heard. So you make history real, you make it enjoyable. Um, thank you for your work at the Smithsonian, no matter how difficult it was. Um, I know over the years, everybody's appreciated those exhibits. So, let me, um, let me do a quick closing. Um, next month, we will be joined by Sam Strasner. I hope I pronounced that right, Dr. DeBlack, who will talk about what is a Wonder Boy? 
We're going to find out all about what a Wonder Boy is. Um, so mark your calendar for Wednesday, July 6th at noon. Um, we're going to be hybrid next month. So you'll get to come. If you want to come in person, you can come in person. You can also watch here on Zoom from the comfort of your home. But we'll be in room 124 of Roberts Library. So we're not going to be in the Dara Center this summer. 124 of Roberts Library. Um, bring your your lunch and we will have drinks and cookies just like in the pre-times. So thanks again, Pete. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank everybody for listening.